Hello and welcome to our video summarizing all you need to know about Tess of the Dubervilles, a novel by Thomas Hardy. My name is Barney and in this video we will look at Tess of the Dubervilles, specifically beginning with some context related to the author Thomas Hardy as well as ideas at the time this novel was written that you will need to be aware of. We will then look into the novel's plot in detail and examine the necessary information you will need to know about it before looking at each character in the novel in depth, key themes related to this novel, as well as important symbols. This video is really useful, especially if you are studying Tess of the Dubervilles as part of your English coursework or exams, as we will go into the details you need to know to get top marks. So let's get started. Overview Tess of the Dubervilles a Pure Woman Faithfully Presented is a novel by Thomas Hardy. It initially appeared in a censored and serialized version, published by the British illustrated newspaper The Graphic in 1891, then in book form in three volumes in 1891 and as a single volume in 1892. Though now considered a major 19th century English novel and possibly Hardy's fictional masterpiece, Tess of the Dubervilles received mixed reviews when it first appeared, in part because it challenged the sexual morals of late Victorian England. Moving on to the novel's plot summary, Tess Derbyfield is a 16-year-old simple country girl, the eldest daughter of John and Joan Derbyfield. In a chance meeting with Parson Tringham along the road one night, John Derbyfield discovers that he is the descendant of the Dubervilles, an ancient moneyed family who had land holdings as far back as William the Conqueror in 1066. Upon this discovery, the financially strapped Derbyfield family learns of a nearby relative, and John and his wife Joan send Tess to claim kin in order to alleviate their impoverished condition. While visiting the Derbyfields at the slopes, Tess meets Alec Derbyville, who finds himself attracted to Tess. Alec arranges for Tess to become the caretaker for his blind mother's poultry, and Tess moves to the slopes to take up the position. While in residence at the Derbyville's, Alec seduces and rapes Tess. Tess returns home, gives birth to a son, Sorrow, the product of the rape, and works as a field worker on nearby farms. Sorrow becomes ill and dies in infancy, leaving Tess devastated at her loss. Tess makes another journey away from home to nearby Talbothay's dairy to become a milkmaid to a good-natured dairyman, Mr. Crick. There she meets and falls in love with the travelling farmer's apprentice, Angel Clare. She tries to resist Angel's pleas for her hand in marriage, but eventually marries Angel. He does not know Tess's past although she has tried on several occasions to tell him. After the wedding, Tess and Angel confess their pasts to each other. Tess forgives Angel for his past indiscretions, but Angel cannot forgive Tess for having a child with another man. Angel suggests that the two split up, with Angel going, for, going to Brazil for a year and Tess going back home. Tess agrees and returns to her parents' house. Tess eventually lead, leaves home again for work in another town at Flintcomb Ash Farm, where the working conditions are very harsh. Tess is reunited with some of her friends from Talbothays and they all settle at Flintcomb to the hard work routine. Tess is determined to see Angel's family in nearby Emminster, but loses her nerve at the last minute. On her return to Flintcomb, Tess sees Alec again now a practicing evangelical minister, preaching to the folks in the countryside. When Alec sees Tess, he is struck dumb and leaves his position to pursue her. Alec follows her to Flintcomb, asking her to marry him. Tess refuses in the strongest terms, but Alec is persistent. Tess returns home to find her mother recovering from her illness, but her father, John, dies suddenly from an unknown ailment. The burden of her family's welfare falls on Tess's shoulder. Destitute now and homeless, 
They've been evicted from their cottage. The Derby Fields have nowhere to go. Tess knows that she cannot resist Alec's money and the comforts her family can use. Furthermore, Alec insists that Angel will never return and has abandoned her, an idea that Tess has already come to believe herself. In the meantime, Angel returns from Brazil to look for Tess and to begin his own farm in England. When Angel finds Tess's family, Joan informs him that Tess has gone to Sandbourne, a fashionable seaside resort in the south of England. Angel finds Tess there living as an upper-class lady with Alec Durbeville. In the meeting with Angel, Tess asks him to leave and not return for her. Angel does leave, resigned that he had judged Tess too harshly and returned too late. After her meeting with Angel, Tess confronts Alec and accuses him of lying to her about Angel. In a fit of anger and fury, Tess stabs Alec through the heart with a carving knife, killing him. Tess finds Angel to tell him of the deed. Angel has trouble believing Tess's story but welcomes her back. The two travel the countryside via back roads to avoid detection. Their plan is to make for a port and leave the country as soon as possible. They spend a week in a vacant house, reunited in bliss for a short time. They are discovered, however, and the trail ends at Stonehenge, the ancient pagan monument, when the police arrest Tess and take her away. Before she is executed for her crime, Tess has Angel promise to marry her sister, Lisa Lou, once she is gone. Angel agrees, and he, along with Lisa Lou, witness a black flag raised in the city of Wintonster, signifying that Tess's death sentence has been carried out. The two, Angel and Lisa Lou, leave together and the tragic tale of Tess ends. Moving on to a detailed summary. Phase the First Chapters 1-4 to four. The setting is in Wessex in the south of England during the late 1800s. John Derby Field is on his way home after working as a haggler. He encounters a local parson who tells him of his family history. The Derby Fields are descended from the once famous Dobervilles, a wealthy family dating back to the time of William the Conqueror. John, feeling a rush of superiority, hurries home to tell his family of the good news. The family has had a difficult life, with John a poor provider and his wife barely managing to keep the family fed and clothed. There are seven, there are seven children in all. Tess, or Theresa, is the oldest. Joan, John's wife, hatches a plan to send the 16-year-old Tess to claim kin at a nearby relation, a woman of wealth and position. When John has had too much to drink, Tess and her brother Abraham set out with the family horse to deliver beehives at a nearby farmer's market. While en route, Tess and Abraham fall asleep in the wagon, and the horse, Prince, is killed accidentally by the local mail cart. Because Tess had allowed Prince to wander into the oncoming lane, and had inadvertently caused the accident between the mail cart and the derby field wagon, she feels it is her responsibility to make matters right. It is at this point that John Derbyfield introduces the plan for Tess to visit their Derbyfield relations. Tess initially objects to the plan, but with the family horse now dead, she relents and calls to the Derbyville family to seek money or work. John Derbyfield hatches the plan to send Tess off to a wealthy relations to claim kin. Tess wants no part of the plan and John Derbyfield also expresses his doubts about the plan. Feeling a sense of guilt about the death of the family horse, Prince, Tess agrees to visit the Stoke Derbyvilles. Tess takes a van, a common carrier of the time, to visit. She notices that the home called the Slopes is not old and established, as she had expected. Instead, the house is a recently built. Tess meets Alec Derbyville, the young son of Mrs. Dobeville. Alec is immediately taken by the young, beautiful maid, and he agrees to find a place for her at the slopes. A few days later, a new horse is sent to the Derby Fields along with an invitation 
for Tess to assume a post as caretaker for a flock of Mrs. Doberville's chickens. Tess's departure is a great sorrow for her family, but she agrees to go to Tantridge to help boost her family's fortunes. Upon her return to the slopes, Alec takes Tess on a wild carriage ride in order to scare her and prove himself master over her. She does not give in to his demands and walks a greater portion of the distance to her new home. Chapters 9 to 11 Tess makes a new home in an old house that had once been the primary house at the slopes. It is now a chicken coop. The new house is the centerpiece of the estate. Tess must, along with the other staff, bring the chickens one by one to Mrs. Duberville for inspection. When Mrs. Duberville, a blind 60-year-old woman, asks Tess whether she can whistle, Tess says she can. When she tries later, though, she realizes whistling is a talent she no longer possesses. And so she begins to practice so that she may regain the skill. Alec sees Tess practicing, finds her attempts humorous and offers to coach her. Tess declines his offer, but he persists until, just to be rid of him, she agrees to let him assist her. Alec, taken by Tess and unaccustomed to being de denied, begins to spy on Tess watching her as she works in the house, even hiding behind the bed curtains on his mother's bed to catch her whistling to the birds. Tess makes friends with other housekeeping staff members and they introduce Tess to the dances that they attend on the weekends. The staff goes to nearby Chaseboro to drink at the pub or dance in the dance hall. Because Tess does not have a partner to dance with, she watches the other staff dance. This particular September evening, the cottage staff opt instead for a private dance in the barn of a supplier to the Doberville estate. Alex surprises Tess by appearing at the barn dance. He offers her a ride home, which she turns down. Later, when the cottage staff return home, Tess and Carr, another girl who works at the slopes, get into a fight over Carr's jealousy at Alex's attention towards Tess. Alec rides up and rescues Tess from a small mob of resentful women. He takes her away from a beating she surely would have suffered at the hands of the cottage staff women. Instead of returning directly to the slopes, Alec meanders along, hoping to take advantage of Tess in a vulnerable state. He finally actually loses his way in the dense fog. He leaves Tess in the woods as he goes to find a cottage for directions back to Trantridge. When Alec returns to Tess, he finds her asleep and rapes her, knowing that he has worn down Tess, Tess's defence over the last few months. Phase the second, chapters 12 to 15. In October, four months after her arrival in Trantridge, Tess leaves the Doberville estate to return home. Alec pursues her, offers her a ride home and she accepts. He admits to his mistake and begs Tess's forgiveness, but to no avail. She leaves Alec in the road near her home, walking the remainder of the way. Along the way, she encounters a sign painter who signs preach against vice and sin. Tess's mother is the first to encounter Tess when she enters the family home, and the two talk about Tess's experiences. Here, Tess asks her mother, Why didn't you tell me there were danger in men folk? Joan still believes that her daughter might have a chance to marry Alec Duberville and become a real lady, but she is too simple or ignorant to understand Tess's dilemma. Joan's response is to make the best of it, I suppose. Tess has visits from her village friends, but these visits are not enough to raise her impending depression. Even church affords no comfort to her as the churchgoers whisper and gossip about her. After suffering the fall and winter at home, Tess is next seen the following August working as a field labourer harvesting corn. We see for the first time that Tess has a baby and stops to breastfeed him during the lunch break the harvesting crew takes. Later that night, the infant falls ill. All sense that the child will die sometime in the next few days. Tess, realising that her baby has not been baptised, gathers her siblings and baptizes the infant herself. During the ceremony, we learn that the child's name is Sorrow, 
after the phrase in Genesis 3.16, In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Sorrow is buried in a nearby, in a nearly forgotten part of the church graveyard, where the unbaptized infants, notorious drunkards, suicides and others of the conjecturally damned are laid. The fall turns to winter and winter turns to spring. In May, Tess, now 20, sets out again on her second excursion to find work in a nearby town at Talbothay's Dairy. She wants solitude and time away from home where she might be happy in some nook which she had no memories. Her journey takes her to a beautiful valley called Blackmoor on the river Froome, where a new phase of her life begins. Phase the Third Chapter 16 to 20 Having arrived for the position of milkmaid at a dairy in Talbothays through a friend of her mother's, Tess leaves home for a second time. At 20, she is now more experienced in the world. It is late in the afternoon when she arrives at the dairy and she is in time for the afternoon milking of the cows. She introduces herself to Mr. Richard Crick, the dairyman, and immediately begins work. In the milking parlour, Tess does not actually meet the other workers, but she hears them as they perform their chores. There is discussion among the other workers about some cows going azew or dry. Superstitiously, the workers believe that because there is a new hand come among us, the cows are not as likely to give as much milk. A tale from medieval times is told to entertain the workers, and a song is sung to make the work easier and to coax the cows to be generous with their milk all the kinds of banter one would expect in a milking parlour. Finally, a strange voice chimes in, and we are introduced to Angel Clare. Angel, at age 26, is the youngest son of an area parson. He has come to Talbothays to learn the business of the dairy farm so that he may one day become a farmer himself. Tess recognises Angel from the May dance in Chapter 1. She fears that he will discover her past and shun her. Tess learns of Angel's past when she shares a room, which is over the milking room, with three other milkmaids. Hardy interrupts Tess's story to explain Angel's history. Angel hopes to have a farm of his own, either in England or in an English colony. Angel's desire came as a surprise to his father, the Reverend James Clare, who learned of his youngest son's intentions only when books about farming were delivered to the Clare home. When his father questioned Angel about how he can be interested in such books when he plans to become a minister of the gospel, Angel informed his father of his plans, claiming that he cannot support all of church doctrine. He can only accept those tenets that he himself cannot bridge. Angel went to London to see the world and to discover a new profession for himself. In London, he fell in love with an older woman, who almost entrapped the young Clare in marriage. He was extricated from the situation and settled on farming as a profession. Tess and Angel's relationship starts off slowly, but begins to develop when he lines up Tess's cows for her, the ones that are hard to milk. The two later meet while Angel is playing a second-hand harp for entertainment and a conversation ensues. Angel finds Tess rather mature, mysterious. Tess decries her lack of education and Angel volunteers to tutor her in any subject she might choose. Tess replies, I shouldn't mind learning why, why the sun do shine on the just and unjust alike. Angel chides her for being so negative about life. Chapters 21 to 24 the entire dairy is paralysed when the milk does not begin to turn to butter. It is suggested that the butter won't come because perhaps somebody in the house is in love. Mr. Crick doesn't believe the superstition but instead tells a rather raucous story about a man who had just gotten a young girl pregnant. Tess hears the tale and while others laugh at the story, she rushes outside because the story of Jack Dollop is too real for her. Eventually, the butter begins to form in the churn and all settles down at the farm. The resident milkmaids, Petty Pradul, Isyut and Marion, take turns gawking at Angel by peeking at him 
from their room as he moves through the farmyard. Tess does not engage in the girl's sport and Marianne suggests that Angel is in love with Tess, that he likes Tess Derbyfield best. All the maids are in love with Angel, but even they seem to sense that Tess and Angel are beginning to show signs of love for each other. It is mid-July and the weather has turned quite warm, both morning and night in the Blackmoor Valley. One Sunday, the four maids ready themselves for church on their way as a heavy summer downpour had flooded the rivers and creeks, an overflowing creek stops them. Coming from the direction opposite the church is Angel. He volunteers to carry each girl across the swollen current so that their Sunday frocks are not ruined. All of them, including Tess, are shocked and delighted that Angel would spontaneously extend an opportunity for each of them to be held so close to their ideal man. As Angel crosses the creek with Tess, he hints at his feelings for her, telling her that he has undergone three quarters of the labour entirely for the sake of the fourth quarter, meaning that he carried the other three girls across so that he could carry Tess across too, and that he did not expect such an event today. When Tess replies that she also had not anticipated the heavy rains and swollen creek, Angel realises that Tess does not realise his meaning. Feeling that he is taking unfair advantage of an accidental situation, Tess carries her the rest of the way across and deposits her with her friends. When Angel again leaves, Tess's companions tell her that although Angel likes her best, he is meant to marry another woman, chosen by his family. During the hot summer at Talbothes, the relationship between Tess and Angel grows, as Hardy notes, it was impossible that the most fanciful love should not grow passionate. The ruddy blossoms existing there were impregnated by their surroundings. Angel secretly watches Tess as she works and musters the courage to tell her of his love for her. Phase the Fourth Chapters 25 to 30 Angel has turned a new corner in his life, feeling that he belongs on the dairy as a farmer and that Tess is the right choice as a wife. Angel leaves the dairy to visit his family and to tell his parents about Tess. Angel's brothers, Felix and Cuthbert, disapprove of Angel marrying Tess but do little to discourage him. His parents had intended Angel to marry Miss Mercy Chant, a real lady and local teacher. Angel is against this union and proposes to his parents that Tess Derbyfield would be a much better choice. Angel and his father debate the merits of Mercy and Tess as suitable wives for a farmer. Angel's wishes win out with his father's concern, expressed by his question. Is she of a family such as you would carry to marry into? A lady, in short. His parents warn Angel not to rush into a hasty marriage with an unknown woman. But his descriptions of her are enough. Reverend Clare relates a story of a convert, one Alec Duboville, who has become a lay minister and street preacher. Angel returns to the dairy and asks Tess to marry him. Tess says that she cannot. Angel persists, not being too aggressive in his tactics to convince Tess, but she insists, I am not good enough, not worthy enough. Alone, Tess wonders why her past has not caught up to her at Talbothes, and she feels both positive pleasure and positive pain as she wrestles with her feelings for Angel and the past that is bound to catch up to her. She resolves to give in to Angel's proposals. I shall give way. I shall say yes. I shall let myself marry him. I cannot help it. Tess rethinks her position, even suggesting that any of, of the other milkmaids would be worthy wives for Angel. Angel refuses Tess's suggestions, and when Mr. Crick needs a volunteer to drive the milk, now late for delivery, straight to the train station in Agdon Heath, Angel volunteers, and Tess goes along for the ride. It is during this ride, in a downpour of rain, that Angel learns that Tess comes from the Durberville family. He suggests that she adopt the Duboville spelling and he quells her fears about his hating old families. Relieved, Tess accepts Angel's marriage proposal 
if it is sure to make you happy to have me as your wife and you feel that you wish to marry me very very much then Tess kisses Angel and he discovers what an impassioned woman's kisses were like upon the lips of one whom she loved with all her heart and soul as Tess loved him. Tess insists that she write her mother in Marlott and Angel then remembers that day four years earlier during the May dance that he had seen Tess but had not danced with her. Tess writes to her mother and receives a response by the end of the week. Joan Derbyfield tells Tess not to tell of her past. Joan also mentions that a barrel of alcoholic cider will be sent for a wedding present. Tess decides not to tell Angel of her history. Everyone at the dairy seems to know that Tess will someday marry Angel. Even when the maids feel some jealousy toward Tess at the possibility of marriage, they cannot bear her any ill will. Tess tells the young maids, You are all better than I. Tess cannot bear to keep silent on the matter of her past and she vows to tell Angel all of her history, despite her mother's advice not to. Tess sets the date of their wedding as December 31. The time for Tess's services at the dairy are at an end. Angel is also finished with the apprenticeship at the dairy and seeks a new aspect of farming for study. He settles on the flour mill at Wellbridge to learn about milling flour. He then proposes a tour of other farms during the first day of the year. Stopping to visit his parents in March or April, Tessa's bridal ground ar arrives a simple dress and the wedding arrangements are completed. Angel and Tess travel to the nearby town, Vale of Blackmoor, on Christmas Eve to do some last-minute shopping. There, Tess sees two Trantridge men who know of her past and speak of it loud enough for all to hear. Angel confronts the men who admit their possible mistake conf of confusing Tess with another woman. The incident disconcerts Tess, who asks Angel if the wedding can be postponed. He asks her to forget the incident. Tess writes a four-page note to Angel that explains her history and slips it under his door. However, the note becomes lodged under the carpet and he never reads it. Tess later finds the note and destroys it. The pair remain as guests at Talbothay's until the day of their wedding. No one from Derbyfield or Clare families attends the ceremony. Instead, the Cricks and all the workers at, Tal at Talbothay's attend the services. After they leave the wedding ceremony, Tess tries to confess her past sins, but Angel will not hear of it. When Tess says that the carriage they're riding in seems familiar to her, Angel recalls the legend of the Durbelville coach. During the 16th or 17th century, a Durbelville supposedly committed a dreadful crime in the family coach, and that, since that time, only the Durbelville family members can hear the coach whose appearance foretells a tragic or bad event. Upon leaving Talgothes, an old white rooster crows in mid-afternoon. In the world of the farm, an omen for bad fortune. The house the newlyweds stake in Wellbridge is an old Duberville home, complete with old Duberville portraits on panels in the walls. The luggage from Talgothes is late, but Tess receives a package from the Clare family of heirloom jewels which Tess immediately puts on. The luggage arrives via Jonathan Cale, a Talbothay's dairyman, who tells the new couple that Retty had tried to commit suicide. Marion gets dead drunk and Iz is moping around the house depressed. Tess feels guilty that she had some hand in the incidents that happened to her friends. Then Tess and Angel confess their sins. First Angel, then Tess. Phase the Fifth Chapters 35 to 38. Angel cannot forgive Tess for her past. Oh Tess, forgiveness does not apply to the case. You were one person, now you're another. Tess is dumbfounded by Angel's reaction and seeks to have him understand her plight. He cannot see her past as she sees it. Tess suggests that they will no longer be able to live together and that she could end his suffering through divorce or her own suicide. Angel rejects both propositions. He adds injury to insult, saying, Decrepit families imply decrepit wills, 
decrepit conduct. Tess is nearly speechless. Instead of remaining with his wife on their honeymoon night, Angel sleeps on the couch downstairs. The next morning, Angel is the first to speak, suggesting a reconciliation, but it is a false hope. The couple, sure of marital bliss, now must decide what is to happen next. Tess tries to make her point clear to bring Angel around to her viewpoint. She accepts her punishment. She took everything as her deserts. She asks Angel, You're not going to live with me long, are you, Angel? He responds, I cannot. Finally, Angel suggests that Tess go home to her family in Marlott. She agrees. During that night, Angel, in a deep sleepwalking state, comes to Tess's room and carries her out into the night. He mumbles that his wife is dead, dead, dead. Tess dare not disturb this sleep episode. Angel seems to be recalling the incident in which he carried the milkmaids at Talbothes in chapter 23, taking Tess over a river and into a small ruined chapel where he lays her in an empty stone coffin. He lies down beside her, continuing to sleep. Tess rouses him carefully and leads him back to the couch in their house. The next morning, Tess does not tell Angel of the evening's events as he begins to pack their belongings for their trip to Talbothes and from there to Marlott, Tess's home. At Talbothes, the couple do not disclose their discord. Angel gives Tess a good sum of money before he leaves her and tells her to write to him via his parents if she needs anything. Then he leaves Tess near the entrance to her hometown. Tess enters the town through a back route, going unnoticed into her family's home. When Tess tells her mother of her plight, the two cry over the events. Joan suggests that Tess hide in the house when her father returns so that Joan can prepare John for the shock of a marriage begun and ended in three days. John is indeed astonished and Tess resolves to remain only a few days at home. During the short period that she is home, Tess receives a letter from Angel telling her that he is in the north of England searching for a farm. Tess gives her mother half her money from Angel and leaves home. Chapters 39 to 41 Angel returns home to his parents in Eminster. He brings up the possibility of going to Brazil to be a farmer with his family. Naturally, they are taken aback at his suggestion of so sudden a move, far away to another land. Angel's idea is to work for a year in Brazil and to bring Tess later when he is established. His parents ask about her character and physical attributes, which Angel says are the best. Angel meets his former intended bride, Mercy Chant, on his way home. They discuss his upcoming journey to Brazil, where he says to her, I think I'm going crazy. Angel puts away the jewellery and money for Tess with a local banker and meets Isiot on his way back to his house. He asks Is if she will join him for the dip to Brazil and she agrees. He realises his impetuous actions and reconsiders asking Is to leave with him. Five days later, Angel leaves for Brazil. Eight months pass and Tess is in dire straits with little income in irregular work. She gives half of her money to fix the roof on her family's home at Marlott and uses the rest for food and clothing. She is down to her last pennies when she remembers a letter from Marion and prospects for a job as a field woman. Grueling work at best. Tess's journey takes her from Marlott to Flintcomb Ash, not far from her home. On the way, because she hasn't even enough money for lodgings, she sleeps in a forest where she encounters wounded pheasants shot by hunters who have lost track of the injured creatures. To put them out of their misery, Tess kills the suffering birds. Chapters 42 to 44 To ward off the men who might find her attractive, Tess puts on a handkerchief as though she has a toothache and clips her eyebrows. She arrives at Flintcomb Ash to find Marianne already at work. Marianne calls the farm a starve acre place, not like the lush dairy at Talbothes. The work is digging, the work is digging rutabagas, harvesting corn, and making the thatch for roofs. It is indeed difficult work for men and women alike. 
Tess agrees to work until 6th April, also known as Old Lady Day. The two friends work in the rain and snow at the farm. Marion writes to Iz, who later comes to Flintcomb Ash for work as well. One day, when it is too cold to dig swathes, the ladies are sent by the farmer to make roof thatching in a nearby farm. Also working there are Dark Car and the Queen of Diamonds, both former employees of the Dubervilles at the Slopes. These two Amazonian sisters do not remember Tess from their previous encounter. Tess meets her employer, the farmer, the same man who had insulted her in town in Chapter 33 and who appears again in a second chance encounter in Chapter 41. He is mean and vengeful towards Tess, telling her, but we'll see which is master here. He urges the girls to work harder and Tess stays behind to finish her work with Iz and Marion. Tess is overcome by exhaustion and faints. As she recovers on a haystack, she overhears Iz tell the story of Angel, asking her to accompany him to Brazil. Tess decides to contact Angel's parents to ask about Angel. The next Sunday, Tess sets out for Eminster, a 30-mile round-trip walk for her. A year has passed since her marriage to Angel, and she is determined to make her plight known to her in-laws and to see if they have heard from Angel. She removes her walking boots, stashes them in a nearby bush, and puts on her dress boots to impress, to impress her in-laws. Angel's brothers discover Tess's boots, not knowing she is nearby, and takes them back to Claire's vicarage. Tess loses her nerve to see the Claire's and returns to Flintcomb Ash, dejected and depressed. On the way back to the farm, Tess encounters Alec Duberville, now an evangelical, fire and brimstone street preacher. Phase the Sixth Chapters 45 to 49 Tess is disturbed greatly by Alec Duberville's appearance once again, now as an evangelic minister. He has taken on the appearance of a common person, not like his appearance earlier as a man of wealth. Alec stops his sermon when he sees Tess. He tells Tess of his, con of his conversion and his mother's recent death. He apologises for his past once he learns what happened to Tess after she left Dantridge and he makes Tess swear never to tempt him again. Alec finds Tess working in the field at Flintcomb Ash the next morning and asks her to marry him. She refuses. He tells her that she is a deserted wife and that her husband will not return. Alec leaves her and returns the same afternoon to ask her to leave with him again. She does not and he blames her for his regression to his former self. In a later visit, Alec repeats his pleas for Tess's hand and she slaps his with a heavy work glove. He returns that same afternoon and offers to take Tess away from the hard labour on the farm. He also offers to help her family, which is Tess's one weak spot. Tess leaves Alec to begin an impassioned letter to Angel to urge him to come, her, to, come to her at once. The letter reaches the Clares in Eminster who forward it to Angel. Angel has had his share of misfortune as well, becoming ill in the wild of Brazil and having buried a fellow farmer who had died from disease. He feels remorse for his treatment of Tess, now having a change of heart from his previous position. When Tess nears the end of her time at Flintcomb Ash, her sister Lisa Lou arrives to tell her that both of her parents are ill and that Tess must come home. Tess immediately leaves for Marlott that evening. Chapters 50 to 52. Tess travels the Wessex countryside and arrives at Marlott at 3 a.m. She finds a neighbor sitting with her parents, both of whom are ill. Tess also finds that the allotment for the family garden has not been planted. She and Lisa Lou begin work at once on the garden while the parents recuperate. Tess even works by moonlight to complete the spring gardening task. Alec finds Tess in the garden and approaches her to tell her that he has left a gift for her at the house. Lisa Lou returns to tell Tess that their mo mother has recovered but their father, John Derbyfield, has died. With John dead, the family is evicted. Another larger family has procured the home. Tess and her family, however, feel as though the eviction has been precipitated because of Tess's past and the scorn of the villagers. The family hires a cart and horse to take them to a nearby town. 
Alec appears again to lend his support, but Tess refuses his help. Tess spends a passionate letter to Angel, as she feels she cannot resist the temptation of Alec and his willingness to aid her family. The next day, as the family makes its way to the nearby town, Tess meets Marianne and Is, who have now begun work for another farmer. She relates what has happened to her father. Upon her arrival, the family learns that their intended house has been rented to someone else. All of their goods are unloaded in the churchyard, while a new house is procured. As the family beds down under the stars for the night, Tess goes into the church and finds Alec lying on a tomb. He frightens Tess when she sees his body on top of a crypt. Meanwhile, Marion and Iz write a letter to Angel, urging him to come at once. Chapters 53 to 56 Angel's parents await his arrival from Brazil anxiously. He returns looking older and thinner from his journey to Brazil. He reads Tess's letters, immediately writing to her mother, Joan, to see if she is well and living at home. Joan's curt, short letter tells him she is not at home and Joan does not know Tess's whereabouts. Further, Angel finds that Tess had not visited his parents, nor had she asked for any money in his absence. Angel makes pleas to leave at once to find Tess when he reads a letter from Marianne and Is. Angel first goes to Flintcomb Ash and Marlott to locate Tess. Instead, he finds John's grave and pays the sexton, or churchyard caretaker, for the balance owed on John's tombstone. He finds that the family is in Kingsbury and sets out for the Derbyfield house. There he finds John and asks her about Tess, only to find she is now living in the fashionable seaside resort of Sandbourne. Angel treks to Sandbourne, arriving late at night, too late to find any information. The next morning, Angel finds Tess at an inn called the Herons, from information provided by a mailman. He goes to the inn and asks for Tess, where she is now known as Teresa Duberville. Tess has been living with Alec and the pair has travelled to the resort for relaxation. Angel sees Tess only to be told that she cannot go with him, that Alec has won her. Repeatedly, Tess tells Angel, it is too late. She sends Angel away, urging him not to return, as she now begins, belongs to Alec. Angel leaves the inn, wandering the streets aimlessly. Tess returns to her room to confront Alec. The innkeeper, Mrs. Brooks, watches the Doubervilles through a keyhole and from her office below their room. Tess realizes Alec's deception, blaming him for lying to her about Angel's future return, so that he could once more have her. In a fury, Tess stabs Alec through the heart with a carving knife. She leaves the inn immediately to find Angel. In the interim, news of the murder moves quickly through the resort. Chapters 57 to 59 Angel hears from his parents via telegram that his brother Cuthbert is engaged to Mercy Jaunt. He leaves his hotel to go to the train station for a return trip home. At the station, Tess finds him and confesses to murdering Alec. Immediately, Angel formulates a plan to walk to the north of England, avoiding the more travelled roads, until they can reach a port city after the events surrounding the murder are forgotten. The two walk for miles, finally happy to be in each other's company. Along the way, they discover a vacant house, with only a caretaker occasionally stopping by. The great house, called Bramshurst Court, is empty of a renter, so the couple takes up residence. They spend five days in the house until the local caretaker sees them sleeping in the large bedrooms. Once discovered, Angel and Tess move directly north until they reach the ancient monoliths of Stonehenge. Tess feels that her freedom is limited and her end is near, so she has Angel promise to marry Lisa Lou after her death. Now that it is night and the two are tired, Tess sleeps on one of the altars of the stone. Near daybreak, the two are surrounded by police, who take Tess into custody. For her part, Tess is glad that the end has come, and she goes with the police willingly. In the final chapter, Angel and Lisa Lou journey together to Wintonster to see that Tess's sentence, death by hanging, is carried out. They do not actually witness the deed, but know the enterprise is done when a black flag is hoisted over the town's tower. The two then return the way they came, 
as soon as they arose, joined hands again and went on. Moving on to character analysis. Tess Derbyfield, intelligent, strikingly attractive and distinguished by her deep moral sensitivity and passionate intensity. Tess is indisputably the central character of the novel that bears her name. But she is also more than a distinctive individual. Hardy makes her into somewhat of a mythic heroine. Her name, formerly Theresa, recalls Saint Teresa of Avila, another martyr whose vision of a higher reality cost her her life. Other characters often refer to Tess in mythical terms, as when Angel calls her a daughter of nature or refers to her by the Greek mythological names Artemis and Demeter. The narrator himself sometimes describes Tess as more than an individual woman, but as something closer to a mythical incarnation of womanhood. In Chapter 14, he says that her eyes are neither black, nor blue, nor grey, nor violet, rather all these shades together, like an almost standard woman. Tess's story may thus be a standard story, representing a deeper and larger experience than that of a single individual. However, behind that beauty, Hardy paints a picture of a tortured mind. Tess could not be described as an exuberant person. She seems to border between marginal happiness to deep depression, and her personality is hidden, like an enigma, even from those close to her. Joan, her mother, says in response to a question Angel asks, I have never really known her. In part, Tess represents the changing role of the agricultural workers in England in the late 19th century, possessing an education that her unschooled parents lack. Since she has passed the sixth standard of the national schools, Tess does not quite fit into the folk culture of her predecessors, but financial constraints keep her from rising to a higher station in life. She belongs in that higher world, however, as we discover on the first page of the novel, with the news that Derby Fields are the surviving members of the noble and ancient family of the Dubervilles. There is aristocracy in Tess's blood, visible in her graceful beauty, yet she is forced to work as a farmhand and milkmaid. When she tries to express her joy by singing lower-class folk ballads, at the beginning of the third part of the novel, they do not satisfy her. She seems not quite comfortable with those popular songs. But on the other hand, her diction, while more polished than her mother's, is not quite up to the level of Alex or Angel's. She is in between, both socially and culturally. Thus Tess is a symbol of unclear and unstable notions of class in 19th century Britain where old family lines retained their earlier glamour, but where cold economic realities made sheer wealth more important than inner nobility. Alec Dubervilles, a non-callant 24-year-old man, heir to a fortune and bearer of a name that his father purchased. Alec is the nemesis and downfall of Tess's life. His first name, Alexander, suggests the conqueror, as in Alexander the Great, who seizes what he wants regardless of moral propriety. Yet he is more slippery than a grand conqueror. His full last name, Stoke Duberville, symbolizes the split character of his family, whose origins are simpler than their pretensions to grandeur. After all, Stokes is a blunt and inelegant name. Indeed, the divided and duplicitous character of Alec is evident to the very end of the novel when he quickly abandons his newfound Christian faith upon re-meeting Tess. It is hard to believe Alec holds his religion, or anything else for that matter, sincerely. His supposed conversion may only be a new role he is playing. This duplicity of character is so intense in Alec and its consequences for Tess so severe that he becomes diabolical. The first part of his na surname conjures associations with fiery energies, as in the stoking of a furnace or the flames of hell. His devilish associations are evident when he wields a pitchfork while addressing Tess early in the novel, and when he seduces her as a serpent in Genesis seduced Eve. 
Additionally, like the famous depiction of Satan in Milton's Paradise Lost, Alec does not try to hide his bad qualities. In fact, like Satan, he revels in them. He bluntly tells Tess, I suppose I am a bad fellow, a damn bad fellow. I was born bad and I have lived bad and I shall die bad in all probability. There is frank acceptance in this admission and no shame. Some readers feel Alec is too wicked to be believable. But like Tess herself, he represents a larger moral principle rather than a real individual man. Alec symbolizes the base forces of life that drive a person away from moral perfection and greatness. Angel Claire, a free-thinking son born into a family of a provincial parson and determined to set himself up as a farmer instead of going to Cambridge like his conformist brothers, Angel represents a rebellious striving toward a personal vision of goodness. He is a secularist who yearns to work for the honour and glory of man. As he tells his father in chapter 18, rather than for the honour and the glory of God in a more distant world. A typical young 19th century progressive, Angel sees human society as a thing to be remoulded and improved, and he fervently believes in the nobility of man. He rejects the values handed to him and sets off in search of his own. His love for Tess, a mere milkmaid and a social inferior, is one expression of his disdain for tradition. This independent spirit contributes to his aura of charisma and general attractiveness that makes him the love object of all the milkmaids with whom he works as at Talbothes. As his name suggests, Angel is not quite of this world, but floats above it in a transcendent sphere of his own. The narrator says that Angel shines rather than burns and that he is closer to the intellectually aloof poet Shelley than to the fleshly and passionate poet Byron. His love for Tess may be abstract, as we guess when he calls her daughter of nature or Demeter. Tess may be more an archetype or ideal to him than a flesh and blood woman with a complicated life. Angel's ideals of human purity are too elevated to be applied to actual people. Mrs. Derby feels easygoing moral beliefs are much more easily accommodated to real lives such as Tess's. Angel awakens to the actual complexities of real-world morality after his failure in Brazil and only then he realizes he's been unfair to Tess. His moral system is readjusted as he is brought down to earth. Ironically, it is not the angel who guides the human in this novel, but the human who instructs the angel, although at the cost of her own life. Moving on to theme analysis, the theme of unfairness. Unfairness dominates the lives of Tess and her family to such an extent that it begins to seem like a general aspect of human existence in Tess of the Dubervilles. Tess does not mean to kill Prince, but she is punished anyway just as she is unfairly punished for her own rape by Alec. Nor is there justice waiting in heaven. Christianity teaches that there is compensation in the afterlife for unhappiness suffered in this life. But the only devout Christian encountered in the novel may be the Reverend Mr. Clare, who seems more or less content in his life anyway. For others in their misery, Christianity offers little solace of heavenly justice. Mrs. Derbyfield never mentions otherworldly rewards. The converted Alec preaches heavenly justice for earthly sinners, but his faith seems shallow and insincere. Generally, the moral atmosphere of the novel is not Christian justice at all, but pagan injustice. The forces that rule human life are absolutely unpredictable and not necessarily well disposed to us. The pre-Christian rituals practiced by the farm workers at the opening of the novel and Tess's final rest at Stonehenge at the end remind us of a world where the gods are not just and fair, but whimsical and uncaring. When the narrator concludes the novel with the statement that justice was done and the president of the immortals had ended his sport with Tess, we are reminded that justice might be put in ironic quotation marks, since it is not really just at all. What passes for justice is in fact one of the pagan gods enjoying a bit of sport or a frivolous game. 
Social Class in Victorian England. Tess of the Dubervilles presents complex pictures of both the importance of social class in 19th century England and the difficulty of defining class in any simple way. Certainly, the Derby Fields are a powerful emblem of the way in which class is no longer evaluated in Victorian times as it would have been in the Middle Ages, that is, by blood alone, with no attention paid to fortune or worldly success. Indubitably, the Derby Fields have purity of blood, yet for the parson and nearly everyone else in the novel, this fact amounts to nothing more than a piece of genealogical trivia. In the Victorian context, cash matters more than lineage, which explains how Simon Stokes, Alex's father, was smoothly able to use his large fortune to purchase a lustrous family name. The Dubervilles pass for what the Derby Fields truly are, authentic nobility simply because definitions of class have changed. The issue of class confusion even affects the Clare clan, whose most promising son, Angel, is intent on becoming a farmer and marrying a milkmaid, thus bypassing the traditional privileges of a Cambridge education and a parsonage. His willingness to work side by side with the farm labourers helps endear him to Tess, and their acquaintance would not have been possible if he were a more traditional and elitist aristocrat. Thus, the three main characters in the Angel Tess Alec Triangle are all strongly marked by confusion regarding their respective social classes, an issue that is one of the main concerns of the novel. Male Domination One of the recurrent themes of the novel is the way in which men can dominate women, exerting a power over them linked primarily to their maleness. Sometimes this command is purposeful in the man's full knowledge of his exploitation, as when Alec acknowledges how bad he is for seducing Tess for his own momentary pleasure. Alec's act of abuse, the most life-altering event that Tess experiences in the novel, is clearly the most serious instance of male domination over a female. But there are other, less blatant examples of women's passivity toward dominant men. When after Angel reveals that he prefers Tess, Tess's friend Retty attempts suicide and her friend Marianne becomes an alcoholic, which makes their earlier schoolgirl type crushes on Angel seem disturbing. This devotion is not merely fanciful love but unhealthy obsession. These girls appear utterly dominated by a desire for a man who, we are told explicitly, does not even realize that they are interested in him. This sort of unconscious male domination of women is perhaps even more unsettling than Alex's outward and self-conscious cruelty. Even Angel's love for Tess, as pure and gentle as it seems, dominates her in an unhealthy way. Angel substitutes an idealised picture of Tess's country purity for the real-life woman that he continually refuses to get to know. When Angel calls Tess names like Daughter of Nature, and Artemis, we feel that he may be denying her true self in favour of a mental image that he prefers. Thus, her identity and experiences are suppressed, albeit unknowingly. This pattern of male domination is finally reversed with Tess's murder of Alec, in which, for the first time in the novel, a woman takes active steps against a man. Of course, this act only leads to even greater suppression of a woman by men when the crowd of male police officers arrest Tess at Stonehenge. Nevertheless, for just a moment, the accepted pattern of submissive women bowing to dominant men is interrupted, and Tess's act seems heroic. Moving on to some important quotes. Quote, Don't you really know, Derby Field, that you are the lineal representative of the ancient and knightly family of the Dubervilles? who derive their descent from Sir Pagan Duberville, that renowned knight who came from Normandy with William the Conqueror, as appears by Battle Abbey Roll? Never heard it before, sir. In this passage from Chapter 1, the local parson informs Mr. Derbyfield of his grand lineage, thus setting in motion the events that changed the fate of Tess Derbyfield forever. Interestingly, the parson's tone is casual, as if he is unable even to conceive of how his news might lead to tragedy later. For the parson, it is genealogical trivia, 
but for Dobbyfield, it feels like fate, the deepest truth about himself, like Oedipus's discovery of his own identity. The fact that this prophetic news is delivered on the road in an open field right at the beginning of the work is reminiscent of the opening of Macbeth. There the witches address Macbeth as a thane of Cawdor and king of Scotland, just as the parson addresses Derbyfield as Sir John. As in Macbeth's case, the noble address leads to disaster and death. In this case, the death of the rightful Duberville, Alec. Hardy emphasizes the irony of Derbyfield's situation, not only by contrasting the common peddler on the road with the image of the renowned knight, who was his forebear, but also by contrasting the modes of address of Derbyfield and the parson. The parson has just addressed him as Sir John, which sets the whole conversation in motion. But we see here that the parson soon lapses back into the familiar tone more appropriate to one addressing a social inferior. Don't you really know Derbyfield? Derbyfield does the same. Despite his discovery that he is Sir John, it is he who calls the parson Sir here. The ironies multiply, making questions of class and identity complex and unstable, as Hardy int intends to depict them. Quote, Claire came close and bent over her. Dead, 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 he murmured, after fixedly regarding her for some moments with the same gaze of unmeasurable woe he bent lower, enclosed her in his arms, and rolled her in the sheet as in a shroud then lifting her from the bed with as much respect as one would show to a dead body, he carried her across the room, murmuring, My poor, poor Tess, my dearest darling Tess, so sweet, so good, so true. The words of endearment withheld so severely in his waking hours were inexpressibly sweet to her forlorn and hungry heart. If it had been to save her very life, she would not, by moving or struggling, have put an end to the position she found herself in. Thus she lay in absolute stillness, scarcely venturing to breathe, and wondering what he was going to do with her, suffered herself to be borne out upon the landing. My wife. Dead, dead, he said. In chapter 37, Angel Clare begins to sleepwalk on the third night of his estrangement from Tess having rejected her as his wife because of her earlier disgrace. Like Lady Macbeth's sleepwalking scene, Angel's nighttime somnambulism reveals an inner conflict within a character who earlier seems convinced of a moral idea, in control and inflexible. For Lady Macbeth, her earlier cold protestations that killing a king is justifiable are belied by her unconscious fixation on being bloodstained. For Angel, the situation is reversed. He consciously maintains a conviction that Tess is bad, corrupt and cannot be forgiven. But his unconscious sleepwalking self reveals the tender love and moral respect for her so good, so true that he feels somewhere inside him. This revelation foreshadows his final realization, too late that his condemnation of Tess was wrong-headed. Angel's words, dead, 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 hint at Tess's future death but they also signal Angel's conception of Tess. She is alive physically, but for him, she is dead morally, as dead as an idea of purity that he once revered. Quote, Under the trees, several pheasants lay about, their rich plumage dabbled with blood. Some were dead, some feebly twitching a wing, some staring up at the sky, some pulsating quickly, some contorted, some stretched out, all of them writhing in agony except the fortunate ones whose tortures had ended during the night by the inability of nature to bear more. With the impulse of a soul who could feel for kindred sufferers as much as for herself, Tassa's first thought was to pull the still living birds out of their torture, and to this end with her own hands she broke the necks of as many as she could find leaving them to lie where she had found them till the gamekeepers should come, as they probably would come, to look for them a second time. Poor darlings, to suppose myself the most miserable being on earth, in sight, oh such misery as yours, she exclaimed, 
her tears running down as she killed the birds tenderly. Unquote. Tess stumbles upon the pheasants, feeling like a haunted soul. The dying birds symbolize her own condition. It is a strange and unexpected image, since throughout all the scenes of farm life we have witnessed in the novel, there has never been any killing. Farming is always associated with production, never with loss or sacrifice. But hunting is different. It kills creatures and does so unnecessarily. The image of silently suffering victims of violence evokes Tess's quiet acceptance of her own violation at the hands of Alec. In a literary sense, these flightless birds stand in sharp contrast to the high-flying birds of romantic poetry. We recall that Angel is compared to Shelley, who wrote an ode to a skylark. Romantic birds leave the earth below to soar into a higher plane of existence, but the birds here have no such luck, having been shot down as Tess has been. Tess's killing of these suffering birds suggests that she is killing off that part of herself that has quietly accepted many years of agony. After this scene, Tess begins to show a more active resolution that culminates in a final murder of Alec. Her newfound activity may not save her. Indeed, her punishment for the murder, presumably death by hanging, will snap her neck just like she snaps the necks of these pheasants. Nevertheless, it may be preferable to her earlier passivity, providing her with a nobler way to face her fate. Unquote. Justice was done, and the president of the immortals had ended his sport with Tess, and the doberville knights and dames slept on in their tombs unknowing. The two speechless gazers bent themselves down to the earth as if in prayer, and remained there a long time, absolutely motionless. The flag continued to wave silently. As soon as they had strength, they arose, joined hands again, and went on." Unquote. The tired and unimpassioned tone suggests that narrator's weariness with the ways of the world, as if quite similar with the fact that life always unfolds in this way. Nothing great is achieved by this finale. The two figures of Lisa Lou and Angel went on at the end just as life itself will go on. Ignorance rules rather than understanding. The Duberville ancestors who caused the tragedy are not even moved from their slumber, blithely unaffected by the agony and death of one of their own line. Tess's tale has not been a climactic unfolding, but a rather humdrum affair that perhaps happens all the time. Moving on to a biography of Thomas Hardy. Thomas Hardy was born on 2nd June 1840 in Dorset, England and died on 11th January 1928 in Dorchester. He was an English novelist and poet who set much of his work in Wessex, his name for the counties of southwestern England. Thomas Hardy's Early Life and Works Hardy was the eldest of the four children of Thomas Hardy, a stonemason and jobbing builder, and his wife, Jemima. He grew up in an isolated cottage on the edge of open heathland. Though he was often ill as a child, his early experience of rural life with its seasonal rhythms and oral culture was fundamental to much of his later writing. He spent a year at the Willard School at age eight and then moved on to schools in Dorchester, the nearby county town, where he received a good grounding in mathematics and Latin. In 1856, he was apprenticed to John Hicks, a local architect, and in 1862, shortly before his 22nd birthday, he moved to London and became a draftsman in the busy office of Arthur Blomfield, a leading ecclesiastical architect. Driven back to Dorset by ill health in 1867, he worked for Hicks again and then for the Weymouth architect, G.R. Crickney. Though architecture brought Hardy both social and economic advancement, it was only in the mid-1860s that lack of funds and declining religious faiths forced him to abandon his early ambitions of a university education and eventual ordination as an Anglican priest. His habits of intensive private study were then re redirected toward the reading of poetry and the systematic development 
of his own poetic skills. The verses he wrote in the 1860s would emerge in revised form in later volumes. Example, Mutual Tones and Reddy's Phases. But then none of them achieved immediate publication. Hardy reluctantly turned to prose. In 1867-68, he wrote the class-conscious novel The Poor Man and the Lady, which was sympathetically considered by three London publishers but never actually published. George Meredith, as a publisher's reader, advised Hardy to write a more shapely and less opinionated novel. The result was the densely plotted Desperate Remedies, published in 1871, which was influenced by the contemporary sensation fiction of Wilkie Collins. In his next novel, however, the brief and affectionately humorous idyll Under the Greenwood Tree, published in 1872, Hardy found a voice much more distinctively his own. In this book, he evoked within the simplest of marriage plots an episode of social change. That is, the displacement of a group of church musicians that was a direct reflection of events involving his own father shortly before Hardy's own birth. In March 1870, Hardy had been sent to make an architectural assessment of the lonely and dilapidated church of St. Juliet in Cornwall. There, in romantic circumstances, later poignantly recalled in prose and verse, he first met the rector's vivacious sister-in-law, Emma Lavinia Gifford, who became his wife four years later. She actively encouraged and assisted him in his literary endeavours, and his next novel, a Pair of Blue Eyes, published in 1873, drew heavily upon the circumstances of their courtship for its wild Cornish setting and its melodramatic story of a young woman, somewhat resembling Emma Gifford and the two men. Friends become rivals who successively pursue, misunderstand and fail her. Hardy's break from architecture occurred in the summer of 1872 when he undertook to supply Tinsley's magazine with the 11 monthly installments of A Pair of Blue Eyes. An initially risky commitment to a literary career that was soon validated by an invitation to contribute a serial to the far more prestigious Cornhill magazine. The resulting novel, Far From the Madding Crowd, published in 1874, introduced Wessex for the first time and made Hardy famous by its agricultural settings and its distinctive blend of humorous, melodramatic, pastoral and tragic elements. The book is a vigorous portrayal of the beautiful and impulsive Bathsheba Everdeen and the marital choices among Sergeant Troy, the dashing but irresponsible soldier, William Boldwood, the deeply obsessive farmer, and Gabriel Oak, her loyal and resourceful shepherd. Middle period of Hardy's life. Hardy and Emma Gifford were married against the wishes of both their families in September 1874. At first, they moved rather restlessly about, living sometimes in London, sometimes in Dorset. His record as a novelist during this period was somewhat mixed. The Hand of Ethelberta, published in 1876, an artificial social comedy, turning on versions and inversions of the British class system, was poorly received and has never been widely popular. The Return of the Native, published in 1878, on the other hand, was increasingly admired for its powerfully evoked setting of Egdon Heath, which was based on the sombre countryside Hardy had known as a child. The novel depicts the disastrous marriage between Eustacia Y, who yearns romantically for passionate experiences beyond the hated Heaths, and Klim Yobright, the returning native, who is blinded to his wife's need by a na naively idealistic zeal for the moral improvement of Egdon's impervious inhabitants. Hardy's next works were The Trumpet Major, published in 1880, set in the Napoleonic period, and two more novels generally considered minor. It was not easy for Hardy to establish himself as a member of the professional middle class in a town where his humbler background was well known. He signalled his determination to stay by accepting an appointment as a local magistrate and by designing and building Maxgate, the house just outside Dorchester in which he lived until his death. Hardy's novel, The Mayor of Casterbridge, published in 1886, 
incorporates recognizable details of Dorchester's history and topography. The busy market town of Casterbridge becomes the setting for a tragic struggle, at once economic and deeply personal, between the powerful but unstable Michael Henchard, who has risen from workman to mayor by sheer natural energy, and the more shrewdly calculating Donald Farthfrey, who starts out in Casterbridge as Henchard's protégé but ultimately dispossesses him of everything that he had once owned and loved. In Hardy's next novel, The Woodlanders, published 1887, socio-economic issues once again become central as the permutations of sexual advance and retreat are played out among the very trees from which the characters make their living. And Giles Winterbone's loss of livelihood is integrally bound up with his loss of Grace Melbury and finally of life itself. Wessex Tales, published 1888, was the first collection of short stories that Hardy had long been publishing in magazines. The subsequent short story collections are A Group of Noble Dames, published 1891, Life's Little Ironies, published 1894, and A Changed Man, published 1913. Hardy's short novel, The Well-Beloved, serialized in 1892, revised for volume publication in 1897, displays a hostility to marriage that was related to increasing frictions within his own marriage. Hardy's late novels. The closing phase of Hardy's career in fiction was marked by the publication of Tess of the Dubervilles in 1891 and Jude the Obscure in 1895, which are generally considered his finest novels. Though Tess is the most richly poetic of Hardy's novels and Jude the most bleakly written, both books offer deeply sympathetic representations of working class figures. Tess Derbyfield, The Erring Milkmaid, and Jude Foley, The Studious Stonemason. In powerful, implicitly moralized narratives, Hardy traces these characters' initially hopeful, momentarily ecstatic, but persistently troubled journeys toward eventual deprivation and death. Though technically belonging to the 19th century, these novels anticipate the 20th century in regard to the nature and treatment of their subject matter. Tess profoundly questions society's sexual mores by its compassionate portrayal and even advocacy of a heroine who was seduced and perhaps raped by the son of her employer. She has an illegitimate child, suffers rejection by the man she loves and marries, and is finally hanged for murdering her original seducer. In Jude the Obscure, the class-ridden educational system of the day is challenged by the defeat of Jude's earnest aspirations to knowledge, while conventional morality is affronted by the way in which the sympathetically presented Jude and Sue change partners, live together and have children with little regard for the institution of marriage. Both books encountered some brutally hostile reviews and Hardy's sensitivity to such attacks partly precipitated his long contemplated transition from fiction to poetry. So that's all for now. If you found this video useful, we would really love it if you could give it a thumbs up. Also do subscribe to our channel where we offer lots of free material that you can use as part of your studies to get a better understanding of specific areas that you might find challenging. Also, if you need more information, either on this novel or more generally for other areas in your course, make sure to visit our website, which is www.firstratetutors.com. There you will find useful revision guides, model answers and tools that you can use to get top marks in your coursework or exams. Thank you for listening.